kind of simple. Figured I should probably go into a little bit more detail about some of the more complicated stuff. So, <clears throat> it looks really similar. I just changed the background, but it'll be fine. So, atomic radius, again, same thing as it was before, um, where it's just, it's the size of an atom as measured by taking the <clears throat> two identical atoms, bonding them together, since an electron cloud, you know, it doesn't just like end, it kind of fades out. You, you really can't measure the distance right here. Um, you take the distance between two nucleuses, which you can measure, um, and then cut it in half, and there you have a radius. Uh, the general trend for atomic radius is that the bigger guys are down here in the bottom left-hand corner, and the little guys are up here in the top right corner. And this trend is actually very um, predictable and very accurate. One thing I do want to point out is that Yes, atomic radius increases as you go down, and the reason for that is because you have more energy levels. You know, using our building analogy that we've been using for a while now, this basically means each time you go down, uh, you're adding another floor to your building, and so that makes your building bigger. What you wouldn't expect is this right here, that the atomic radius goes down going this direction. You would expect, okay, this has more protons, more electrons, so it should get bigger. But what happens is <clears throat> as the positivity in the nucleus increases, meaning as you get more protons, protons attract electrons. They like each other and they want to be near each other. So if you add more protons, it actually causes the electrons that are circling around to kind of be drawn in towards the nucleus. So it just causes the whole outer energy level to condense in just a bit, which makes these guys, as you go across a period, they get smaller. Yes, there are, you know, little exceptions here and there, but the general trend is that it gets smaller as you add more protons. <clears throat> so arrange the following groups in order of increasing atomic size. Looking at your periodic table for this first group, we have rubidium, sodium, and beryllium. Um, Beryllium is going to be the smallest because it's on energy level 2. Sodium's on energy level 3, so it's next. And then rubidium is going to be the biggest because it's down at uh, energy level 5. For strontium, selenium, and neon, they are... Let's see. So neon's going to be the smallest, energy level 2. Selenium, energy level 4, is next smallest. And then strontium will be the biggest. And then for iron, phosphorus, and oxygen, oxygen will be the smallest, then phosphorus, then iron. <clears throat> Next term that we're going to talk about is ionization energy. And this is how much energy it takes to yank an electron out of a neutral atom. That's for first ionization energy. You can have multiple ionization energies. Um, and basically, each ionization energy tells you which electron you're removing. So first ionization energy removes the first electron from the first valence electron. Second ionization energy, you've now removed two electrons from that atom. Third ionization removes three um, electrons from the atom. And it's basically, it looks like this, you have to put energy into the atom to remove an electron, kind of like you're paying an atom to take its electron. Um, and something to recognize, this is your general trend here, um, over here in your non-metal region, the ionization energy gets higher because if you remember, these guys, they have, you know, seven valence electrons, six valence electrons, five, and four. And so to look like a noble gas, it's in a way easier for them to gain the remaining electrons and look like that noble gas than lose these electrons and look like that one. So these guys don't want to lose electrons and it's going to take a lot of energy to convince them to get rid of their, their electrons. It's not to say they can't do it, because they can, but they just aren't real fond of it. Whereas metals down here, they have one or two valence electrons. Real easy to yank these guys off. They don't require a whole lot of energy to do that, because they want to do it anyways. Uh, now, the one thing I was saying about the different ionization energies is... <clears throat> You can actually tell, if you looked at a table of ionization energies, I'm just going to make up some numbers here just for an example's sake. Let's say we're dealing with calcium. 
and we're looking at a table of ionization energies for calcium. You would see that the first ionization energy of calcium is, say, 200. I don't know if this is right. Energy is measured in kilojoules per mole, by the way. Uh, make up a second ionization energy for calcium would be like 400 kilojoules per mole. And then the third ionization energy, the energy required to yank a third electron off of calcium, let's say is 14,000 kilojoules. You notice, little jump here, giant jump here. And the reason for that is calcium has two valence electrons. It's in group two, two valence electrons. So this removes one of those valence electrons. This removes the second one. This third ionization energy is now removing a core electron, which is not an easy thing to do because once calcium has lost two electrons, it now resembles argon and it doesn't want to lose any more electrons. And so you're going to have to fight pretty hard to get that third electron out of there. Similar thing happens, let's say, in group five. Let's say we're dealing with nitrogen. And again, I'm just making up these numbers. These are not actual numbers. Just for example's sake, the first ionization energy of nitrogen, let's say, oh, it's right here, 1,402. Second ionization energy, let's say it's like 1,850. Third ionization energy maybe is 2,500. Fourth ionization energy, uh, how about 3,500? Fifth ionization energy, let's say 5,000. Sixth ionization energy, let's say 25,000. You can see, kind of gradual increase, increase, increase. Right here was where it shot up. And that's because nitrogen and the elements that are in group 15 have five valence electrons. So removing valence electrons, yeah, it requires a bit of energy but it's removing, it's not that hard, but removing a core electron, that's just gonna make the element really sad, so it's not gonna do that very willingly. And the reason it goes up, the reason that the, the ionization energies do gradually go up, is because once you've removed an electron, you're now dealing with a positive atom. And yanking another electron to make it go to a positive two, it's gonna take a little bit more energy to do that takes even more energy to go to a positive three, which is why most elements don't go much higher than positive three. There are elements that can go all the way up to like a plus seven, um, but it takes quite a bit of energy and quite a bit of convincing, figuratively speaking, to do that. <clears throat> so arrange the following groups in order of increasing first ionization energy. You'll see that these are the same groups that we had in the last example question. So increasing first ionization energy, that means low ionization energy to high, so looking at this, rubidium, sodium, beryllium, it's going to be just right in that order. Um, strontium, selenium, neon, again, in that order. Neon, actually, it's got a really, 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 really high first ionization energy because it's a noble gas, meaning it's happy with its electrons just as it is. It doesn't want anybody taking any electrons from it. So the noble gases have especially high ionization energies. And then iron, phosphorus, oxygen, again, it's already written in the right direction, so hey. All right, electron affinity is the next trend that we need to talk about. And it is almost the exact opposite of ionization energy. This is the energy, and instead of the word change, I'm going to use energy release, because this is a negative number. It's the energy released when an electron is added to a neutral atom. It is an exothermic process. Just like on the last, um, on ionization energy, you have to put in energy to yank an electron out. In this case, when you give an atom an electron, they're going to spit out the energy. And so, just like ionization energy, when the non-metals didn't want to give up their electrons, they're very excited to get more electrons. So, the halogens especially, that's this group right here, they're going to be willing to get more electrons and they're going to be very excited to do that so they'll give off a lot of energy. This row right here that you can't really see, those are the noble gases. They don't have an electron affinity at all because if you give them electrons they're going to go, what do you want me to do with these? I'm going to have to build a whole another floor to my little fake building to house these electrons. And so they're not going to be excited at all. And if you notice this group which is group uh, 15 
this is nitrogen right here in blue, purple is phosphorus. Uh, these guys, it drops instead of continuing to go up. And the reason is elements in group 15 have the orbital notation that is the P is half filled, which means if they add another electron, well, we've just lost the stability of a half filled P sublevel. So, I mean, they'll be excited because they are nonmetals. They do want more electrons, but they're not going to be as excited as like the halogens who only need one more electron to fill this outer energy level. I mean, these guys are like crackheads going to score some cocaine or something. They're so excited to be getting that electron. Um, same thing happens with group two over here as with group 15. They have the 1s sublevel that's already filled. So if they get another electron, they've got to add on a whole other P sublevel to put that electron in there. So they're really not going to be excited to do that. So, order the following sets of atoms, uh, in least exothermic electron affinity to the most. And so, um, least excited is going to be nitrogen in this case. So to go nitrogen and then oxygen fluorine, so it was already in order. Aluminum, silicon, phosphorus. Oh, look at that, it's already in order too. Huh. Sorry. Uh, now, the last thing that I wanted to talk about was electronegativity, and this only applies when an atom is in a compound, not when it's by itself. If it's by itself, you can't measure electronegativity because what it is is it's a measurement of how strongly a particular atom attracts all of the bonding electrons when it's in a compound because basically when elements bond with each other, they kind of throw all their valence electrons into a pool this is figuratively speaking, y'all, this is not literal. Uh, and one element is either going to take all of those electrons, and we tend to call that bond an ionic bond. We'll talk more about those later. So, uh, sometimes the electrons, you know, the element might take most of the electrons, and the other ones go to the other atom, and that's more of like a polar bond. And then very rarely do you have a bond where all of the elements share it evenly. Um, and so electronegativity is, is the measurement of how well the electrons are shared. Fluorine is the element with the highest electronegativity. It was just kind of given the value of four, and every other, everybody else's electronegativities were based by comparison to fluorine. Uh, basically, if you bond with fluorine, she's going to take all your electrons. And this is very nice picture. You can see it's a great predictable trend with electronegativity um, increasing right here towards fluorine. This right here is uh, krypton and xenon. They are like the only noble gases that have electronegativities because they're the only noble gases that bond. <clears throat> and in actuality, they'll only bond with fluorine. We won't get into why. So I got an example question here that I kind of don't know that I have time to do on this video. Ooh, I might. I can spit it out real quick. Um, element 117, what would be its electron configuration? We'll just do noble gas to save time. So that would be, you work this out on your own and then hit play when you're ready. Uh, sorry, not XE. It'll be radon. And then 7S2, 5F14, 6D10, 7P5. What element will it resemble most chemically? Probably astatine, because that's the one that's right above it in the same group. What will be the formula of the neutral binary compounds it forms with? Well, seeing as UUS will form a negative one compound, sodium is going to be a plus one, magnesium is a plus two, carbon will be a plus four, and in this case, oxygen will be a plus two. So you can just do crisscross there to find your formulas. Um, what oxyanions would you expect it to form? Remember, oxyanions are the polyatomic ions that contain um, oxygen. And so we would expect it to form the oxyanions that are similar to the chlorine oxyanions like hypochlorite, chlorite, chlorate, and perchlorate. And they're all negative one charges. So we would expect it to be the same. Just replace the chlorine with the UUS. Um, and I think that's all we got. So hopefully this kind of helped make that stuff a little bit more clear. And if not, you know where to find me.